All right, well, so far, we've seen in the book of Acts, by way of very brief review, Jesus entrusting uh, the work to his church that she was to do between the time that he ascended and until the time that he returns. This, this is the job. This is the work. This is the ministry. This is the task, okay? The Great Commission, which again is not just simply sharing the gospel with other people so that they might be saved and spared hell. That, that is part of the reason, okay, but that's usually the totality in, in our thinking, but it's more than this. It's to bring the entire world under the lordship of Jesus Christ and to lead them to the worship of God. Ultimately, the reason why God saves anyone is that they might worship Him. Not just on Sundays, but with their whole lives throughout the entirety of the week and the month and the years until they enter into the retirement program God has for us in, in heaven. So we've seen that job entrusted to the church. We've seen uh, Jesus' ascension to the right hand of God to receive the authority that he needed to, uh, for, for the church to succeed in this work. We've seen the giving of the Holy Spirit so that she, the church, we, would have the power to fulfill the Great Commission. Now, we've also seen that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and this new courage that was given to them resulted in the conversion of 3,000 souls at Pentecost, 3,000. And then 5,000 more at the temple, which we saw last week after the Lord used Peter and John to heal the lame man, uh, which was a tremendous testimony to begin with, and their testimony that this one who had been put to death publicly, Jesus the Christ, had been raised from the dead. Okay, he's no longer dead, but he is now alive. He has overcome death, and those who trust in him will also overcome in him. And then lastly, we saw that they were arrested by the authorities in the temple. This morning, we want to see what happened after that arrest. And we also want to see from this how the Lord can provide strength, courage, boldness to proclaim that truth even in the most difficult circumstances. And I think here we have the most difficult circumstances. So I want us to consider two things from this passage. First of all, the courage that the Spirit gave Peter and John to testify before the leaders of Israel. And then secondly, the disciples' prayer that results in an even greater courage to evangelize. And of course, remembering that the same Spirit has been given to us, we have the same command to be filled with the Spirit, we have that same potential to tap into this power source to be able to do what the Lord has called us to do. Now, first of all, we see the courage that the Spirit gave to Peter and John to testify before the leaders of, of Israel. Now we read the next day after they had spent the night in jail, the Sanhedrin convened in order to examine them. And Luke here gives us a list of who these people are. And I think you'll likely recognize at least two of the names in this list, Annas and Caiaphas. Annas being the older of the two, Caiaphas actually being married to the daughter of Annas, which means that uh, Caiaphas was Annas's son-in-law. But both of these are called high priests uh, in, in the Gospels. Um, when a man was called to the office of, of high priest, he held it for life. But for some reason, Annas had been deposed by the Roman procurator Valerius Gratus. I love those Roman names. Those are, they just sort of roll off the tongue, don't they? Valerius Gratus. And then Caiaphas was basically installed in his place. The Jews, however, considered Annas still to be the high priest because they didn't recognize Rome's authority to depose him. So functionally, there were two high priests during the days of our Lord Jesus and during the days of our disciples, of the disciples. But I want you to notice both of these men are now, you know, those two who had a hand in condemning Jesus. He was put on trial at Annas' house and then put on trial at Caiaphas' house who had condemned Jesus just a few weeks earlier. We're only a few weeks in to um, basically from the day of Pentecost. So we don't know exactly how long, but it wasn't very long. These same men are now putting the disciples on trial to try to silence them. Now, the first thing the council concerned itself with was, by what authority have you done this miracle? By what power or in what name have you done this? 
Now, the council understood that Peter and John had done a miracle. It was something that was so clear that they could not deny it. But their real question was, where did you get the power to do this? Where did you get the authority? In whose name did you do this? Now, again, remember, these are the same men who handed Jesus over to the Roman authorities to crucify. And they could just as easily do the same to these men who were on trial answering this question. But though that was true, Peter did not hesitate to identify himself with Jesus. Notice what he says in verses 8 through 10. Rulers and elders of the people, if we are on trial today for a benefit done to a sick man, as to how this man has been made well, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead, by this name this man stands here before you in good health. Now, you know, when, when we look at Peter, I mean, don't you, don't you think, man, I wish I had that kind of boldness, that kind of courage, because how often do we find in ourselves the, the lack of courage even to identify ourselves as Christians, to let other people know that we believe that the Bible is true and that we trust what God says and that we are believing on the Lord Jesus Christ who gave his life for us so that we might live when really the worst thing that could possibly happen to us is somebody might not like what we have to say, get angry at us, might think we're foolish. They might give us some kind of an offhanded remark. But I want you to notice that Peter spoke at the risk of his own life. Okay, that's quite a bit different. He had courage. And I think we want this kind of courage. So let's look a little bit more as to how we might actually find this courage. Now, not only did Peter name the name that he should, you know, should be most afraid of naming, and he would have, except by the Spirit of God. Uh, he did many other things. He charged these Jewish leaders with the murder of Jesus. We're going to see later as they continue to, to preach after they, after they tell, him, tell them, don't do this anymore. They're going to continue to do it. And when they bring them back again, they say, are you intent on bringing this man's blood on us? You know, you're telling everybody we murdered him. Okay, well, that, that would take a great deal of boldness to confront them with their crime, a terrible crime against God and against his law. Peter also testified to the resurrection, you know, whom God raised up again. That's, remember what they paid the soldiers at the tomb in order to cover up? They're trying to suppress this, and here is Peter is, again, declaring it in front of them. He also declared that God sovereignly allowed them to, to commit this crime in order that he might bring about the greatest good, the salvation of his people. And that's what's behind his comment in verse 11. He, that is Jesus, is the stone which was rejected by you, the builders, but which became the chief cornerstone. God raised him up and made him basically the foundation of salvation. And then Peter said something that likely would have infuriated them more than anything else and something that people hate to hear about today. I, I think we all know people who would hate this, that Jesus is the only way to God, okay? Verse 12, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. This Jesus you murdered? God raised him up, and he is the only way of salvation. Now, remember the, who these people were. They are the Pharisees. They are the Sadducees. They are the, the priests, the scribes, the lawyers. They're the ones who believe that salvation comes through keeping the law through self-righteousness. But what Peter is saying is your self-righteousness, your law-keeping, your good works are not enough. As Paul tells us, they are all filthy rags, nothing more than, than a mountain of dung, in God's eyes, the only righteousness that God will accept is that of his son, and that only comes by trusting in Jesus. Now, as I've said, this is perhaps still the most offensive thing that we have to tell an unbeliever. Most unbelievers think that if there's a heaven, they're going to go there anyway because they're just like these Jewish leaders. 
they think they're good enough and that God's going to accept them. But then you run into other people who are from various religions, uh, maybe even religions of their own making, who believe there's many different, uh, again, spokes, many different ways to God, to the hub. I don't need to go this one particular way. It's not Jesus only, but that's what Jesus says. Jesus himself said, as we saw last week, that he is the way, he is the truth, he is the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through him. So Jesus himself says that there is only way, one way, and that is the way of Jesus Christ. And we need to tell other people because it's true. And even though we realize people aren't going to like to hear that, we still need to say it. Now, Peter was willing to say that, again, in front of a group of people who had the potential to kill him. The question we need to ask is, what gave Peter this boldness? What changed him from the person who denied Jesus three times, and that in front of servants, to one who was willing to say these things in the face of the leaders of Israel who had just put Jesus to death? Well, Luke told us in verse 8, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And this is a very real Phenomenon, if I can put it that way. It's a very real experience that we can all experience. Now, we know the Holy Spirit is not just a, an, he's not an impersonal force. He's not just power. He is the third person of the Godhead. He's the one Jesus promised his disciples in the upper room that he was going to send. He is the one that was sent at Pentecost. And he is the one who makes all the difference. He's the one who gives this boldness. Now, as I told you, Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.7, which we had in our meditation, and I also included it as our memory verse. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power and love and discipline. And I would argue that that power comes from that love. You know, when you love something strongly enough, some, in this case, someone strongly enough, you will do everything in your power to please that person, and you will overcome every obstacle to do it. And that's exactly what gave Peter that courage on the day of Pentecost, that courage at the temple, that courage to speak in the face of these uh, Jewish leaders, is he loved Jesus enough and desired his honor enough to speak. You know, and courage, remember, is not, doesn't mean you're fearless. It doesn't mean that there's no fear. It means that you have the power to overcome that fear and actually do what the Lord calls you to do. That's why Paul tells us that we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit so that we will have the strength we need to be able to obey our Lord's call to get this gospel out and to tell our, our friends and our loved ones and our, our children who don't want to believe these things to tell them that this is the truth and they need to believe it. And again, if we need to give them arguments, well, we'll give them arguments. And that's what we're going to be looking at, of course, in the evening. Now, to this point, no one in the council recognized Peter or John, but their boldness, in spite of their lack of education and training, which apparently was evident to them, I mean, they weren't in any of their schools, they didn't recognize them as their disciples, so they must be uneducated. This made them take a second look, and they began to recognize them as having been with Jesus. Hey, I know who these guys are. They were with that one we crucified, the one that claimed to be the Messiah. But what are we going to do about it? They looked at the man who had been healed. By the way, we didn't read about that in the last chapter, but we do read about that here. Apparently, the lame man was taken into custody along with Peter and John. And he was there as evidence. They looked at him, the fact that he was made well. They didn't know what to say. And so they decided to go into a closed session, put the, the apostles outside and began to debate. What are we going to do with these men? Everyone in Jerusalem is convinced that they've done a miracle. Now, notice here, first of all, in what they said here. What they said was likely hyperbole, which means it was a bit exaggerated. And we, we see that in Scripture. That's, you know, that's legitimate to do. On, on one occasion, Caiaphas was trying to emphasize to his compatriots the danger that Jesus posed. He says, look, the whole world has gone after him, Okay trying to make his point that, yeah, he's affecting a lot of people, not the entire world, not yet, 
just basically in Judea and Samaria and Galilee. You know, not the whole world, but again, in this case, it was very unlikely that all of Jerusalem had heard about this miracle, but a lot of people had, okay? And it shows us what these 5,000 people were doing who were converted at the temple. They were spreading the message everywhere. What the apostles had done in the name of Jesus and why they had done it. And so everyone was hearing uh, what was going on. And by the way, isn't this what the Lord wants us to do? Tell other people what Jesus has done. Tell them what they, he has done for us. Well, they, they continued. Uh, he, this miracle has taken place. Everyone knows about it. We cannot deny it. Again, the Lord's miracles are so clear, there's never any question that a miracle has taken place. And I think in this man's case, because of the length of time he had been in this situation, it was even clearer. But we can't let this spread any further. I mean, we killed Jesus in order to put an end to this movement. We can't let these guys continue to spread his name everywhere. It's going to be worse than it was when Jesus was alive. So let's warn them no longer to speak in this name. That should put an end to this whole thing. So they summoned them and commanded them no longer speak or teach in the name of Jesus. Now, what they said in reply, again, shows us the courage they had. Verses 19 and 20. Whether it is right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you be the judge, for we cannot, we're not able, we can't, we can't stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. Essentially, he's saying, judge for yourselves. If God tells you to do something, and then some earthly magistrate tells you to do something else, who are you going to listen to? Jesus has given us his great commission. Okay? He has sent us on this task. He has told us to speak, and so we must speak. Now, there's two lessons, I, I think, here for us, and the first lesson is this, that God's authority trumps every other authority. We do know that God has ordained the powers that be. He's ordained them in the home. He's ordained them in the church. He's ordained them in government. And he has said that we need to submit to the lawful exercise of that authority. But when those authorities go against what God has to say, we have to obey God rather than man, always. The second lesson is this. The Lord told them to speak. And so they were going to speak. And they were not going to let anything stop them, even at the risk of their lives. Well, our Lord has told us to speak as well, and that is what we must do. Now, after they threatened them, they released them um, and because they realized they had no grounds upon which to hold them or punish them, and perhaps more importantly from their perspective, the people believed God had done this through them. The man who had been healed had been lame for over 40 years which means they had seen this man begging in front of the temple for decades. And they knew his legs were withered, and now they were strong, now he could walk, and they were afraid of what the people would do to them if they hurt the apostles. By the way, there's another lesson in this too, isn't there? When we do what the Lord calls us to do, then he will make sure that no one touches us. Okay, uh, No one harms us. Unless, of course, he allows it for some other good purpose, which he does from, you know, sometimes. But Jesus did say to his disciples, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And here we see Jesus with them, protecting them, using these, old, these men's sin against them. We're, we're afraid that the people will, will basically riot against us and we'll lose our position. Rome's going to come in and take our position away. That's the reason why they kind of swept Jesus away. And now these men are going to do the same thing. We don't want that to happen. Okay, so God will protect us when we do what he calls us to do. Now, that, that's the first main point. Again, we see example after example of courage. We've seen several different lessons through here. But, but secondly and, and briefly, we see the disciples' response to the threat. We see them pray. And the result of that prayer was even greater courage to move forward in this work, even in the face of, of these threats. So after they were released, Peter and John went back to the disciples uh, where they were staying, and he told, they told them what the council had said. And when they heard their threats, 
They knew exactly what they needed to do. They needed to pray. You know, think of it again about our own experience. Isn't it usually the last thing we do, <laughs> pray, rather than the first thing we do? It's kind of like when we've tried to fix the problem every way we can and we fail, then we turn to prayer. Well, this should be the first thing we do. We should seek the Lord in everything. That's what our Lord tells us to do. Look to the Lord for His mercy. And that way, when we do and God helps us overcome the issue, then He gets the glory. Now, let's take a look at their prayer for just a moment. Notice, first of all, they praised Him for His power. You know, the one they were looking to had unlimited power. He's, they say, O oh Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. We might look at this and say, what does this have to do with anything? Well, it has to do with everything because the God who made everything, the God whose power is infinite because he, he made everything. You know, it's, it's boundless, the creation. Uh, since that's true, God has the power to deal with this situation. The one we are looking to can do something about it. When we bring our concerns to the Lord in prayer, the first thing that we should do is reassure ourselves that the God that we're coming to can do something about it. That's the reason why Jesus teaches us to pray in the Lord's Prayer. Yours is the power, okay? The power belongs to you and you alone to do what needs to be done. And so we look to you for it. That's exactly what they were doing here. Now, secondly, they acknowledged God's sovereignty, that what was unfolding and what they were a part of was a part of his plan. This is what he intended would take place, verses 25 through 28. Who by the Holy Spirit, through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand... And the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against this Christ. This is Psalm 2. And then he unfolds the or basically how this was fulfilled. For truly in this city, there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. Now, I want you to notice this was God's plan, to do exactly what he did and for it to unfold exactly as it did. This was not an accident. This was not man overcoming God's plan. I want you to notice something here because I heard this quite a bit in my upbringing in evangelical churches and even in my education in my undergraduate, where they would say, the father sent his son into the world in order to present Jesus to the Jews as their Messiah, and their response should have been to receive him as the Messiah and put him on the throne of David, and if they had done that, the millennium would have come right away. Essentially, you know, the final judgment, everything would have taken place, but the problem was they rejected him, and God had to put it off until another time and to put his plan for the Jews off until another time. Many, many people still believe that today, but that was not God's plan. And he tells us right here it wasn't. What his plan was, was to send him into the world so that he might be resisted and rejected by the rulers of Israel and by the, the kings of the Gentiles, that he would be condemned and crucified in order that he might save his people from their sins. And then his plan was to lift Jesus up into the heavens that he might rule over the world while he extends his rule through his church. That was his plan. That's clearly what his plan is. Now, when we pray, we need to recognize what God's plan is. And his plan is the Great Commission. And we need to pray that he would fulfill that plan, not some other plan that, you know, again, we might have concocted in our mind. This is the plan. And by the way, he only has one plan, not two, not one for the Jews and one for the Gentiles or the church, one for the church, one for the Jews. The Jews rejected God's plan for them, and so God turned to the Gentiles, and he's got Jews and Gentiles in his church. That's his plan that was meant for the Jews. It's the only one plan. And of course, when the Jews stop resisting the Lord and God grants them his grace, they also will turn to the Lord and they will be saved because, again, there is only one way of salvation. And that is through the Lord Jesus Christ. So we need to 
pray that that plan would be fulfilled. And then thirdly, they asked for his help. Okay? You have power. This is your plan. So help us. Help us fulfill that plan. Verses 29 and 30. And now, Lord, take note of their threats and grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence while you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Okay, they prayed for two things. Boldness, courage to speak the word and that God would provide the evidence or the apologetic to confirm his word as they did. By the way, his way of confirming in that way has already pretty much passed from the scene. We're not looking now for miracles. We're going to look for that evidence in another place. But let me just make two applications here. If we are to find courage, we need to pray. When's the last time any of us prayed like this, right? For that kind of courage. And if we are going to be able to give evidence, we need to know what the evidence is. That's what we're going to begin looking at in, in the evenings. Now, the last thing we see here is the Lord's answer to this prayer. And again, realizing they're asking for these things because they wanted to glorify God. We read in verse 31, And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Okay, all of them began to speak the word of God with boldness. Now, when we pray that the Lord would use us to carry out his great commission, and our goal is to give him glory and honor and praise, and also to give this glory to his son, our Lord Jesus Christ, that is when he will give to us the boldness and the courage we need. That is when he will empower us. He's not going to give us power if we're not intending on doing anything with that power. We have to want to do something. We have to be moving in that direction and engaged in doing something, and that's when the Lord will give us that power. And I think that's where we often fall short because we want the Lord to give us the power, and then we'll do it. No, the Lord says, do it, and as you're going, I will give you that power. So let's be encouraged by this example that we've, that we've looked at today, that there, there is power to overcome fear. There is courage. There is the fullness of the Holy Spirit. But let's also see where that, you know, how we get that help of the Holy Spirit. We have to be willing to do what the Lord calls us to do. And as we're setting out to do it, He will give to us this courage and this power to be able to, to carry it out. Well, let's, let's take a moment, shall we, and bow in silent prayer. Let's ask the Lord to help us uh, to uh, uh, apply this, to, to acquire this power.